good to be with you uh, here in Virginia. It's a, a beautiful day out there, even though a little brisk for our Georgia fella. Uh, it's, uh, we've had quite a bit of cold weather this year as well. I don't know, uh, uh, this is probably about the coldest winter I remember being in Georgia for a while. We've actually had snow in South Georgia and North Florida even uh, this year, which is very unusual. I think it's been like about 30 years since some of those areas had seen some snow. So, uh, it's, but it's really nice to be here with you. Uh, just a beautiful countryside uh, driving in this morning uh, from Charlottesville. It was just a beautiful drive and, and looking forward to continuing the week with you. Uh, what they've asked me to do is to kind of give an overview of some of my experiences going around the, around the world, really, and, and talking with some of the best grazers around the world and some of the lessons that we can learn from them. And, and part of this is going to set the tone for the meeting, which is the meeting is really around the, this topic of change and making sure that it makes sense. That if, if this change doesn't, does not uh, uh, pencil out, then it's not really going to be practical or, or profitable for you. So uh, the important part of what we're going to talk about is, is throw out some ideas for you to think about. And, and hopefully something of what we talk about here, or hopefully some things of what we're going to talk about here today, will be th something that you can take back to your farm and, and put into practice and, and make a real practical difference for you. There was a survey that was done of uh, some of the, the main beef cattle companies around the country, including a lot of farms as well as the, uh, the marketing enterprises. I think this, this was published in like Beef Producer Magazine or something like that a few years ago. And they asked them, what is the most important approach to management for, as far as your success in your business? What's the most important thing about that? And they said almost uh, without fail that it was about having an open mind and to being ready to make changes when it's necessary, being adaptable, being flexible. Uh, those characteristics are really what define any good business is that they are able to uh, shift when things need to be shifted and you know as I look at things having grown up on the farm and been in the industry my entire life but then seeing things from a perspective on a on a national scale and even a global scale now there's some changes that are going on in the industry and I think we we need to be ahead of the curve we're, we're, we need to be ahead of that curve as it's, as it's starting to change. One of, the, uh, one of the things I like to do is, is uh, I'm a fan of quotes, and, and I think some of these are very ins inspirational. And particularly, uh, I like this one from Grace Hopper, who was one of the main principles behind developing computers as we know it now, particularly uh, the connected world that we know uh, through the Internet and whatnot. Uh, particularly in the military, and she was a, a rear admiral in the Navy. And one of her most famous sayings is the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it this way. And I think if we, all, I think we can all relate to that growing up on or, or being involved in agriculture, there's a lot of legacy of what granddaddy did or what daddy did. You know, there's a lot of that legacy effect that, that keeps, uh, sometimes it keeps us from doing and making the changes that we really need to make in, in our industry. And I'm going to challenge you to challenge that idea, that concept of, of just because that's the way it's always been does not necessarily mean that's the way it's going to be in the future. And uh, change is really inevitable in many ways. The first thing I want you to kind of create as a mindset is the answer to this question, which is what is your production unit? It doesn't matter if you're manufacturing donuts or, or if you're turning out uh, little blue widgets, you need to know what your production unit is. You need to know what your factory floor is capable of producing, right? So the key question I think that most folks need to answer is, do you seek to optimize your profit per animal or do you seek to profit, uh, ma maximize or optimize your profit per acre? And I'm going to suggest to you that the correct answer to this really needs to be B rather than A. And we oftentimes focus too much on individual animal performance and we lose sight of gain per acre or production per acre as really the, the metric and ultimately profit per acre is, uh, is, is what we really need to key in on. 
that, that philosophy comes from looking at a lot of our uh, grass-fed and, and pasture-based livestock producers. This is Ted and Patsy Hughes from Chantilly Farms in North Georgia. Uh, Ted was uh, our uh, Georgia representative for the forage spokesperson contest at the American Forage and Grassland Council meeting this year in Louisville. And by the way, for those of you that were involved in last year's American Forage and Grassland Council meeting in Roanoke, I want to commend you on, on an excellent presentation and an excellent conference. That, that was really a great conference, probably one of the better ones in the last 10 years or so. Uh, I really enjoyed that. In fact, I would put it right up there with the, uh, the last time it was in Virginia in 2004, which I, was my first event there, and it was an excellent one then as well. But uh, uh, another producer is uh, Dan Glenn, who's also been one of our forage spokespersons in the past. He's in South Georgia. But the reason I bring these folks up is that these folks have, as well as many of the other folks that I deal with, have that, that, that thought that they are not uh, livestock producers necessarily, they are grass farmers. Their crop is grass, they, they market it through their livestock, and they also have this concept of them being stewards first. And, and I'm going to come back to that because that's a very important part of this whole puzzle too, particularly in the light of the fact that Th those folks, and you all in this audience, you're very much in the minority now. I mean, you're only 2% of the, the population, and, and ever in a decreasing proportion of the uh, population of uh, producers. And uh, the stewardship aspect and the stewardship ethic is something that we're going to have to really begin to not only live, we're already living that in many ways, but we're going to have to start preaching that. We need to get that message out. So I'm going to step on a few toes, uh, hopefully not so much here as when I talk about this in Georgia, because this is a real sore subject in Georgia, which is how we have all kind of deteriorated the land over the years, particularly in the southeast, with the type of production systems that we've done there. Now this is a uh, cotton field. This picture was taken in 1930, uh, and it's pretty typical of what had happened for the previous probably 200 years there prior to that, uh, well, at least 150 years or so prior to that. And the problem with, with cotton production was it was extremely intensive land use, uh, mainly because of this extreme amount of cultivation that was done to grow it. Uh, you can see this uh, gentleman is working the cotton here. He's cultivating there in the middle of July. And the problem is, is that for the, uh, the cotton is planted on 44-inch row spaces. Does anybody know why it was planted on 44-inch rows? That was the width of mules were in, exactly. So they get down through it and, and to cultivate it. And the problem is, is that in the, the length of that time during the summertime that that land was laid bare, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for erosion. Now, when we get a rainstorm in, in South Georgia in, uh, in the middle of July, it is a downpour. You know, we get two inches within about 15 minutes or so. Uh, it can be very, very heavy on occasion. And that is why the better part of our soil is somewhere between where it started at and the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. This is an older map now, but I think it really lays out the, the situation, and particularly in the Piedmont region here throughout uh, all the way from Georgia up to uh, Virginia here. If we look at the amount of topsoil erosion that has occurred over the years, these black areas represent over a foot of topsoil has been lost from those areas. Now, up here in Virginia, it's not quite as bad, but there has been a tremendous amount of erosion uh, here as well. The point I'm trying to make is, is that grassland is the, solve, uh, the, the solution for this issue. If we utilize grasslands, we can actually benefit the soil, mainly because of these roots and the root exudates. Those can, that can really rebuild this soil. So some of the best principles of grassland management are really fostering a better soil environment. And I think that's really hitting and starting to resonate folks uh, with folks over this uh, soil health uh, discussion that we're starting to have on a national level. I really believe this statement. I've been taught this my entire life, and I'm sure many of you have been taught this as well. If you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. And that's proving to be very true. 
This is one of my favorite photos I've ever taken because it, it illustrates having a grassland and, and having some clovers in it, but it also illustrates the impact that that manure paddy, the livestock, have on this land as well. In this picture, we also have uh, earthworms. If you look really closely, it's hard to see in this screen, but if you look closely, you can see dung beetles. You can see uh, uh, fungi. You can see, uh, if you were able to look real close, you could see bacteria in that soil. There's a whole host of things going on here that is of benefit to that soil. It's cycling those nutrients, and it's holding more moisture. Uh, there's a lot of benefit to having uh, uh, the grassland system here at work in its, in its truest sense. Now, historically, when I was in school, what we were taught was is that the, the source of organic matter was all the residue that was left over on the, on the top of the ground at the end of the year. And that if you wanted more soil organic matter, you, you left more residue out there. And that's not exactly true. Although that residue is very important for a variety of reasons on the soil surface, as it turns out, so, soil scientists now say that the relative contribution of soil organic matter from the below ground to the above ground is actually more like about 60 to 80 percent of it is coming from the roots and the root exudates. Okay? So a lot of what is going on is actually fostered from below ground. What does that have to do with us in grassland management? Well, the, the key here is what is happening to the roots. And this is a, a root, a grass root. This is a perennial ryegrass root hair, just a fine, fine root hair on a perennial ryegrass. And the little web-like things that are coming off of that are mycorrhizal fungi. Those little hyphae that are go growing out and exploring the soil, they're going out extracting nutrients, extracting water, and they grow in in contact with an individual cell right there. It's encapsulating and surrounding that entire cell. Now what does that mean to us? What that means is, is it's going out and it's, it's being more effective extru extracting nutrients and water out of the soil. So the more that we can foster this, the better off we're going to be. Incidentally, whenever we till soil, you know, you know that, that smell in the spring whenever you have that freshly turned earth? That, that smell that you smell is a compound called geosmin. Geosmin. And it's actually the breaking of some of these hyphal connections, these, uh, uh, the, in that case, actinomycetes, bacteria that are in the soil that are also at work there exploring that soil. So that smell is actually a, a, a deterioration of this kind of structure. So it actually is not necessarily always a good thing. The way to really build this soil is the same way that we build wealth with grasslands, is with good livestock and good grazing management. That's what's crucial here. And so when we think about this and when we are looking at opportunities to really maximize our grazing and, op and improve our efficiency of our grazing, I think it's instructive for us to look at uh, areas of the world that have done this uh, to the nth degree, that are the best in the world at managing grass for grass, uh, past, pasture-based uh, livestock. And I would submit to you that probably the, the best in the world at doing that is what is pictured here. This is in the Waikato region of the North Island of New Zealand. Okay? New Zealand is uh, one of the very most important dairy countries in the world, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the statistics there. But what you're doing is you're setting and looking at this picture, you are looking at the Waikato Valley here, a large river valley there in the North Island of, of, uh, of uh, New Zealand, and there are more dairy cattle per square mile, or in their case, per square kilometer, than anywhere else in the world. It's a very dense population of dairy cattle there, more so than anywhere else in the world, and it's all pasture-based. Very, very few confinement-style dairies there. It's all coming from the pasture, although there is a fair amount of corn silage and some other things that are now being fed there too, but they're really maximizing their, their uh, pasture. Now, when most folks think about New Zealand, they think about the, uh, the, the things they've seen on TV and on the movies, right? Like uh, the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit movies or some of those movies that have been shot 
in this very scenic country, and it's a beautiful place for sure. Uh, and I think many of you might also say, well, what can we learn from someone or a group that's over 8,500 miles away from us? It's a very long way. It's literally the other side of the world from us. But I think there's a great deal that we can learn from this country. Even though there's uh, a lot of uh, di differences between the way they do it, it's just like what, what I tell our students all the time uh, at UGA, the principles are few, but the applications are many. The, the fundamental things that they're doing work just as well if we apply them here as they do to their systems. Even though we may not be growing perennial ryegrass and white clover and have a mild climate like they might have, we can still use some of those same lessons that they use and the same things that they're doing uh, over here in the southeast. Just for comparison purposes, I thought it would be interesting to show uh, some of the statistics about uh, New Zealand here compared to the U.S. Uh, the, our, the population here in the, in the U.S. is over uh, 314 million now. Uh, New Zealand is only 4.6 million. The land area of New Zealand is about the size of Colorado. It's not a very big country. It's a relatively small country uh, out in the middle of the Pacific uh, Ocean there. Their per capita GDP, they're, they're fairly affluent as a country. Um, and they have a very good standard of living. In fact, it's, it's quite expensive to live over there, but they still have a, a quite a good standard of living. Um, their ag as a percent of GDP here is about 4%, which is very similar to our 5% in the U.S. But here's where it gets interesting. They have 6.4 million head of dairy cattle. Now, in the whole of the U.S., we have 8.6. And all, all 6.4 million of those are on the size of Colorado, okay? The, dairy, uh, the beef cattle, they have uh, 3.6 million of those and uh, we're compared to our 30.5 million. But here's, here's one other is really interesting. They have almost 30 million head of, of sheep, uh, which is about six times how many we have. <laughs> all on the size of a country uh, that's the size of Colorado. And uh, I, I kid folks all the time from over there, I said, you all must never have any problem going to sleep because you got plenty of sheep to count to go to sleep by. But uh, they certainly have a lot uh, going on there from an agricultural perspective. Uh, the North Island here has historically been one of the, the pr premier areas for uh, grazing, particularly for dairy. Uh, beef and sheep had pretty much dominated in the South Island, although that's changing. We're starting to see a lot more. Uh, development of the dairy in the in the South Island as well. The North Island is uh, this is an aerial view by the way flying in right into the Waikato region so you can kind of see the extent of their pastures here and how much pasture land is present. They have a very mild climate there. Uh, it rarely gets below freezing uh, and it rarely gets above about 84 degrees on the North Island because the, the North Island is actually equivalent of like uh, the South for us. It's going to be a much more milder climate from that regard. Uh, here's what's really interesting, though, is the land costs. Land costs there are anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand dollars per acre or more. But this is not because of urbanization or something like that. This is actually because of how profitable the dairy industry is there. Um, it really is a, a, a very profitable enterprise for them because they have all the infrastructure that we're going to talk about that supports that. Now on the South Island, uh, the South Island is a lot more arid. It's very drier, uh, much drier, and, and you can kind of see the irrigated areas here and uh, the transition then to the areas that are not irrigated. Um, the South Island is a lot, uh, lot drier and, and a lot more of a seasonal change in temperature. It'd be a more equivalent to the kind of temperature change that we might have here or even further north. Uh, irrigation is extensive there, but water is very limited, and they're having to be very judicious with their use of water, and they're trying to meter that out as, as much as possible. Uh, the land costs there are, are quite a bit cheaper, but still yet, by our comparisons, this is pretty expensive land yet. But because they're able to really utilize that in a, in a uh, very profitable way, particularly in the dairy industry, um, they, they really have... Uh, uh, a big demand for it and they're really expanding. They have also the home to a lot of major innovations particularly with regard to pasture-based management and one of the main innovations there was the development of electric fencing. 
It's kind of a cool story. Uh, the uh, Gallagher Company, or as they call it, Gallagher Company, is uh, started actually by a gentleman trying to keep uh, a horse from rubbing up against his car. <laughs> So he hooked up a capacitor to, uh, to his car and, and uh, so that if the horse rubbed his rear end against it, it'd get a little, little shock and it wouldn't do it anymore. And it worked so well that uh, uh, he lost his horse, but he gained a company. <laughs> so uh, uh, long story short, that led to the development of uh, electric fencing as we know it now. And now we have a lot of different companies supplying uh, electric fencing supplies to us. So in that North Island in particular, but also on the South Island, they're kind of lining up to dairy, and part of that is uh, driven by a farmer-owned and operated company called Fonterra. Ninety-two percent of all the milk that's produced in New Zealand is marketed through the Fonterra co-op. So it's got a lion's share of, that, uh, of the milk production there, and they're a major, major player, not only in New Zealand, but worldwide. The thing to remember is, is although they are producing a huge amount of milk, they don't really consume that much dairy products there in New Zealand. In fact, their per capita consumption of dairy products is 230 pounds compared to our 560 pounds uh, per capita. So almost all of what they're producing is being exported. They have some domestic consumption, but very, very little, and their exports uh, represent about $54 billion dollars. Uh, to the country. Fonterra is the largest co-op in the international market and they actually control about 30 percent of the world's dairy export market, mainly because of how influential they are in the southeastern Asian countries, China, Korea, Japan, and, and other places, India, another big one. So as Fonterra goes, so goes the world market. And actually, uh, Fonterra ha holds uh, auctions every so often with their products and, and basically like a, uh, a Chicago Board of Trade type of, of sale uh, exchange and that really has a major influence on the milk prices that we receive here in the states even. Dairy production is extremely profitable there in New Zealand. It's not the lowest cost anymore. They used to be the lowest cost producer of milk but now uh, there are other countries that produce, a cost, uh, produce it at a much lower cost, but they are very efficient. So it's not necessarily being the least cost producer, it's being the most efficient producer. And ultimately, uh, because of not only their, their efficiencies of production, also on the efficiency of their marketing. Uh, they are very aggressive about their marketing. One, one thing to note, and we'll go into more detail about this later on, is there's no subsidies from the government whatsoever. There are no uh, counter-cyclical payments. There's no uh, uh, price support system of any sort. Uh, they don't even have an extension system as we know it. Uh, we're going to talk about how they, how they solve that problem, how they, how they deal with that in a little while. But every little small town that, uh, that is in the heart of this dairy production area is going to have one of these drying facilities there. Uh, this is a uh, milk drying facility where they make uh, powder. And then they export this powder in, in uh, bags or containers. Um, this is a uh, picture that I took while at a trade show there a few years back. Let me read you this little caption. It says, Fonterra exports 50 million 25 kilogram bags of milk powder and another 10 million, kilogram, or 10 million bags of uh, 50 kilogram uh, milk powder or milk proteins every year. Uh, it's a huge amount that is being exported from their country and, and traveling all across the world uh, to uh, all the way over to South America and Africa and places like that as well. What's really interesting is their, their population of, of uh, farmers there is not very different from what we have. It's, their average age of the farm owner there is 58, which is not too dissimilar to what the average age here in the U.S. is. What is interesting, though, is, is how they manage those farms. Now, this is a gentleman who was a beef and sheep farmer, and uh, you'll notice that he's actually standing in front of a, a rotary parlor that's being installed there on his farm. This is, he's, he's, his statement to me was, as I'm, I'm retiring from the uh, beef and the sheep market, I'm getting into the, into the dairy industry as a retirement plan. Now... You, probably, you have that same reaction that I had. That's, that's nuts. <laughs> that's crazy. 
But it's different over there because those farm owners generally are not involved that much in the day-to-day -day operations. They may be some, but not as much as um, the managers. So they would hire in a manager oftentimes to, uh, to operate these farms. They have very much of a career ladder approach to their, to their farm management there. Most of the time those farm managers are going to be farming on shares in addition to a salary. Now, as a result of all this, and as a result of very high labor uh, cost in general because of high um, minimum wage uh, cost there, the typical manager there uh, has a salary of maybe around $50,000 uh, a year plus profit share. So they would have equity in the cows. Uh, they may own half of, the, uh, half of the herd, and so they would be getting profit off of that. A general laborer position there would be anywhere from $12 to $15 an hour, uh, the equivalent in the U.S. Um, so it's very high labor cost compared to uh, what we would deal with. And they also have mandated holiday and vacation time. There's no, uh, there's no um, exclusion or, or uh, any way that the, the farms can get, get by with this while others can't. They actually hold them to the same standards as all the other companies as well. Now, because they are surrounded by about 500 miles of water in any direction, they don't really need a wall. Their immigration is very tightly controlled, uh, and, and because of all the, um, uh, the, the labor needs, though, they, they actually do need a lot of labor coming in, and so they end up getting a lot of labor, a lot of uh, immigrants coming in from other countries. Um, they end up with uh, a lot of folks from the Southeast Asia countries coming in uh, to work, as well as from India and some of the other countries in that, in that vicinity. What is fascinating to me is that all of their, almost all of their equipment work is contract hired. Now, this is a photo from one of the contractor's uh, lots where he's storing some of his equipment, and you can see all of the equipment that is there is very new equipment. They operate very efficient new uh, equipment. And that, that factors into their efficiency. They can do all of these planting and spraying and hay and balance harvesters, uh, harvestings as uh, much more efficient than what the typical producer could do. Plus, the producer doesn't then have all of the expense of, of uh, all that steel and, and uh, labor that's associated with that. Nearly every town will have three to four contractors that service that particular area. And uh, they usually will have... Even a, even a relatively small town will have an equipment dealership there. So they don't have to go running off for parts or whatnot. And those contractors really do keep those equipment dealerships uh, in business because they are all the time buying new equipment or, or uh, repairing equipment from them. And uh, because of that new equipment, though, they are very time efficient. So the actual producer's uh, overhead cost and their, their payments with regard to the, the machinery and whatnot that they have is relatively minimal. Those, those costs are kept relatively minimal. What's interesting is as you drive along a countryside, it's not at all uncommon to, uh, to see this, this equipment being driven down the road. They rarely would, would trailer it just because they're, they're not going that far typically because they're relatively close. Um, but uh, it is kind of uh, interesting and I, I always often wonder if they're uh, going to crack down on that. They're, they're very uh, regulatory heavy country. I'm always wondering if they'll, they'll crack down on that. But if, uh, if you look at the actual equipment on these farms, it's relatively sparse. Normally what they would have is, uh, you know, a UTV of some sort, a, a four-wheeler or a, uh, maybe even just a motorcycle, one tractor, one mower, and a small sprayer, and that would be about it. Um, almost no half-ton pickups are larger either. That's, that was one of the uh, most, uh, 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 interesting things I've, I encountered when I got down there. You know, you go to a meeting like this and the parking lot's half full of, of uh, half tons, three quarter tons, or ton tr pickup trucks. Uh, it's rare to even see a half ton pickup truck down there. Uh, this is more common. You would see something like a Ford Ranger or a Toyota um, uh, pickup truck, a small pickup truck. And part of the reason for that is diesel is $5 a gallon and gas is $7 a gallon down there. So it's quite expensive to drive these things around, and you want something that's fuel efficient as possible. Plus, if you're not hauling around equipment, and if you're also not hauling around livestock, you, they, they don't really have a need for that. 
They actually haul all of their livestock around by custom work as well. Even if they're moving from one farm to another, they would uh, hire that done. The impact of this, though, is that it filters through the local economy. You go to some of these rural towns, and unlike some of the rural towns in Georgia at least, and maybe Virginia is different than this, but in Georgia, if you go to some of these rural towns, there's not much left there anymore. There is uh, a lot of the shops are shuttered, but here every town has got a very vibrant uh, uh, economy going on there. Uh, every storefront is pretty well occupied. There's not much uh, uh, shuttered storefronts uh, in, that, in that area. The reason for this is, is there's farm suppliers in practically every town. There's uh, ag lenders. There's farm consultant businesses there. And, and uh, they will also have a ready supply of veterinarians, large animal veterinarians. Now, I don't know about you all, but in Georgia, that's been a real problem for us, is having uh, large animal veterinarians in some of the rural areas. Uh, it's really become a challenge. Now, we've enacted some changes there in how we uh, uh, kind of incentivize students going through the vet school to go out and, and do uh, large animal veterinarian work. And it's really changing things, but it's, uh, it, it has gotten to be a real problem for us. Moreover, one of the interesting things is, is that the ag industry there is very much a legitimate career path for young folks. And it's hard in this day and age, I think, to get a lot of folks interested in, in agriculture as a career, even though there's a lot of great opportunities out there. There's a great, there's a great opportunity in agriculture in a variety of different fronts, uh, but it's hard to convince students that that is a, a legitimate career path here. So what can we learn from them? What can we take from them and, and apply here? The first thing I would say is that they learn from their neighbors and their competition. New Zealand has a native bird there they call the kiwi. It, it only comes out at night, and it's a flightless bird. It, does not have, it doesn't fly around, okay? which is really ironic because most of the kiwis that I know, the people, the kiwis that I know, uh, travel a lot. They fly around all over the world. Almost every one of them has traveled abroad at some point. Uh, a lot of them have come over to the States, many of them multiple times coming over to the U.S. Uh, some of them will come over to study and then go back. Some of them will uh, just come over to visit and then, and then uh, go back. But nearly all of them have their finger on the pulse of the, of the world stage. They really know what's going on on the world market. Moreover, one of the fascinating things here is that they learn from each other. And this, more than anything else, I think we should be applying on a regular basis on our, in our operations here in the southeast, is that they get together and they converse over the challenges that they are facing as a group locally. Uh, Ten or twenty of these producers will get together. They'll go to one, other, uh, one of them's farms, and they'll, they'll see what the, how that farmer is addressing a particular issue, and they'll critique it. They'll give him down the road about it. They'll actually say, well, how did you do it that way? Why had you thought about doing it this way? And they basically have to defend what they did. But the, the outcome of that is it's a more, uh, it's kind of like a peer review process. You get, a be, you get it refined. Um, you know the old, the old biblical saying of, of iron sharpens iron or steel sharpens steel? That, the idea there is that you're getting an opportunity there to uh, uh, get it viewed from colleagues who can really give you some real good suggestions. Not only on actual practices, but they will review their economics that way as well. They'll actually open up their records, and they'll go through their records and, and look at cost of production and look at some of the costs that uh, some of them may say that you could save a little bit of money here or there, and so it's a much more uh, economically efficient system there too. The other thing is that they have mastered what I call adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Most of the dairies will rotate two times a day. After every milking, they'll go to a new pasture. And even on the beef and sheep farms, typically they'll rotate every seven to th uh, three to seven days. And some of them will be even more frequent than that. Uh, these are some, some uh, uh, steers, that they're, uh, steers and heifers that they're finishing out for beef. These are actually some crossbreds that have come out of the, uh, the dairy industry, and those, those calves are ultimately destined for beef. But they're rotationally strip grazing these animals, uh, moving those on a daily basis there. 
Here's a, a, a whiteboard from one of these farms, and they have all of their paddocks laid out here. It's kind of hard to see with this uh, uh, on the screen here, but essentially all of their different paddocks are, are laid out, and they have marks on where those different herds are going to be and where they're at now and where they need to be moved to. And so they can mark what, what all gates need to be open and, and how they're going to transport those animals. They can have team meetings to talk about where all these, uh, these animals are going to go. They can also identify animals that are lame or having some other challenges, and they can uh, put them into the hospital herd or whatnot. They also utilize what's known as a pasture wedge or grazing wedge. Uh, has anybody gone to the grazing schools and heard about grazing wedges before? Okay. Grazing wedges are a very useful tool because it, it shows you the growth of the, of the crop. It shows you what you have in every paddock. So each one of these bars represents what is present in each of the paddocks that they have. And so they align those from the most forage down to the least forage. And that dotted line that transects it is actually the line that represents their target. They want that growth rate for those pastures. They want that to, uh, to be right up against that line so that they know that their growth rate is right on track. Another interesting idea that they have here and a practice that they maintain is they practice continuous renewal of their pastures. It's not uncommon to be seeing land that is being converted uh, or, or renovated into new stands. And in fact, about 5 to 10 percent of their intensively managed grazing systems there are going to be renovated every year. Why is that? They are taking such meticulous notes on their pastures and the growth on those pastures, they realize that, the, that we all know, that we, as scientists, we've known this for years, that the perennial grass species, their peak yields are in the first two to three years. And then they begin to slide. So your, your peak is going to be at pretty much year two through five. And then after year five or so, it really starts going down. And then, then it will plateau out at the bottom about 60%. So for those of you that got Kentucky 31 tall fescue out there, for example, in your pastures that were there when granddaddy sold it in, in 1940 or something like that, uh, those pastures probably only really producing about 60% of their potential. You're leaving a lot of money on the ground basically by not renovating those pastures. Now I realize that's a difficult proposition in many cases, but they do this all the time. Even on some really steep ground oftentimes, they're doing major renovations here. Uh, it may not be tilled like this, but they are doing some pretty substantial renovations. Another thing that is very unique about them that we can learn from is that they know their cost of production to the penny. Anytime you went to visit one of these farms, you would ask them, uh, you know, how, what, what kind of economic situation are you in with right now? How are things going? And they would tell you exactly their, their cost to the penny. And they weren't shy about sharing it either. They would say, I'm, my cost right now is $4.50 per, per kilo of milk solids or whatever that, that, uh, that price is. So their, their culture is very focused on economics. They kind of have had to be because of a variety of issues there within their culture and that particularly the ag lending requirements there are extremely tight. If they went in for a loan and they didn't know their, their uh, uh, cost of production, they would have a real, real hard time getting a loan from the ag lenders there. And the farm consultants. And these discussion groups that go and visit with the producers and actually go over their, their economics with them, uh, they really do uh, look at every penny there and how it's spent on their farms. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they don't have any, any safety net of any sort. Uh, they have no subsidies or price support programs there. Now, I'm not arguing for getting rid of that here in the U.S., but what I am saying is, is that has really changed the game for them. And when they got rid of those in the 1980s, it was some dark days for about six or eight months. They, there was a lot of uh, hand-wringing, a lot of challenges. But what has happened out of that is there's been a change in the culture and how they fund um, and how they, how they address it as an industry. And they've built uh, funding into the industry to be able to fund a lot of these issues. In particular, they divided these into the segments. So if you're a beef and sheep producer, uh, you, would, you would pay a levy that goes to the beef and lamb group. And if you're a dairy producer, you would pay a levy that goes into the dairy uh, NZ group that supplies and supports uh, the industry. 
Now that levy is, uh, in the case of uh, beef and sheep, it's on every animal. Or in the case of dairy, it's on every kilo kilogram of milk solid that's processed. And that funds all of the research, or nearly all of the research. There's still some federal research that they do, and some of the universities do some of the research, uh, quite a bit of the research actually. But a lot of it is funded through uh, these industry checkoff dollars, if you will. In U.S. dollars, those levies represent about $3.20 a head for uh, beef cattle, 43 cents per head for sheep, and about a, a, a penny per pound of milk solids, roughly. About a penny per pound of milk solids. So uh, uh, these, far, these uh, levies are farmer-only voted referendums. So every six years they renew this through a voting referendum. And those referendums usually pass with about 80% in favor. Now, I don't know about you all here in Virginia, and maybe you all get along better than what we do in Georgia, but getting, uh, getting producers to agree, 80% of them to agree on anything, is really hard to do. But that shows you the, the popularity of those, those uh, industry-funded levies there in uh, New Zealand. And very few of those Kiwi farmers would say that they want their government subsidies back. Those that remember those days in 1980s and, and before, very few of them would really want those back. Mainly because they, they really do get a lot of service out of these industry-funded levies. Uh, they're very responsive to the industry, very responsive to the producers, uh, and not just to the companies and the other uh, sponsors and whatnot that, that uh, support them. They're, they're very responsive to the producers themselves. And it's not uncommon at all to be visiting these farmers and uh, a, New Ze a Dairy NZ researcher will show up, uh, uh, the farm consultant will be there, a company representative will be there, or a, uh, um, an advisor would be there. What's really interesting to me is how the, the money works here. And if you look at the breakdown, for example, for the dairy industry, uh, they get about $45 million a year for, uh, out of that levy system. 28% of it goes to research and development to increase uh, farm efficiency and profitability. 14% uh, of it goes to industry advocacy and promotion like the uh, beef, beef checkoff and the beef boards and that sort of thing. Uh, but notice here training and education, farm business management, consulting, all of those things are directly beneficial to the producers. I'd also highlight for the folks uh, that are in administrative roles, their administration cost is about 3%. I'm sure Virginia Tech is better than this, than, than what we are, but in Georgia, our administrative cost is somewhere north of 20% at a minimum. Okay? So it's a very, very expensive proposition. Now, the idea here, too, is it's not only the industry support that they get on the front end, but also on the back side, too. They get support from their, their farmer-owned and operated co-ops with Fonterra, which not only supplies the, the milk market and, and sells their product for them, but they also supply the front end, too, with their, their farm stores. Farm Source is a major uh, ag supplier, similar to like uh, Southern States or something like that. LIC is Livestock Improvement Corporation, and that is a genetics company that supplies uh, uh, kiwi-oriented genetics for them. Uh, Farmlands is another one of those uh, uh, supply stores that's farmer-owned and operated. And then their fertilizer industry is also farmer-owned and operated. So all of those are um, uh, cooperatives that are, are farmer-owned and operated. So it's a, uh, very much engaged for the farmer through the whole of the system. And because they are uh, oriented to the producer and oriented toward efficiency and operating in these cooperative environments, the cooperatives have come up with ways to be able to fund some major innovations. For example, on their milk trucks, whenever that milk truck hooks up a hose to a milk tank here, uh, on the back side of that, she is placing onto that a hockey puck. And that hockey puck has actually got a RFID tag in it. And that identifies the truck, it identifies the farm, and it also identifies how much uh, is actually going into the milk tank. And as that milk is being uh, put into the tank, here's the supply line going into the tank. And let's see if I can show this. Yeah, that shows up a little bit better. So here's the supply line going into the tank, and it's taking little sips of that. It has four different vials that it's taking sips of. And those vials uh, will be shipped off for analysis, and that represents that farmer's 
uh, load of, of milk. And on the bottom of each of those vials is another RFID tag, uh, which is in been imprinted with the producer's information. And that RFID tag is, is very small. That's a, the one that's been broken open so you can see what it looks like inside. But that RFID tag is, is giving it all that information, and then that is overnighted. If it's uh, local, it would be just transported to, but if it's on the South Island, it would be flown to this lab in the central part of uh, the North Island of New Zealand. And in that um, facility, they will analyze that very rapidly. They actually have one station there that can do nine different stages of that test at, uh, operating at one time. So every load lot in, the, in New Zealand would be analyzed in 24 hours and a report would be generated the next morning when that milk truck shows up. It's got a little printer on here. It can print out a receipt from yesterday's uh, load. It would say on it your somatic cell count. It'll say how much milk solid you've got, uh, your protein and your uh, fat content and that sort of thing. And then it also would tell you uh, if there are any other issues like any kind of uh, uh, antibiotics or something like that that might have been found in the milk. Uh, so they also would get an email of, of that data as well the, the previous evening probably. Now how do we bring this back down to uh, Ted and Patsy's place and, and to Dan's place here in, in Georgia or to your place here in Virginia? Well, I think one other thing that we need to really recognize is the emphasis here on stewardship. And what I find fascinating is how the Kiwis have really adopted more of a of a stewardship ethic. They've had some challenges and they're learning from those challenges and now they really are uh, gearing toward uh, solving some of the problems that they've had. Now about 10 years ago I was visiting New Zealand and they took us up to a, a overlook that looked over a broad valley and what you could see basically as far as the eye could see you could see big piles of cleared land and stumps and whatnot uh, there was about, um, I think it was a total of about 50 or 60,000 hectares. So that's, we'll just call that rounded numbers, about 100,000 acres. Okay, Those were being divided up into 500 acre blocks of dairies. So 500 dairy here, a 500 acre dairy here, a 500 acre dairy there. Like a dairy subdivision, instead of building houses, they were making dairies out of them. And the problem was is that massive clearing of land to do this. I mean, they were in such a rush to build these dairies. They had literally everyone who could co tote a chainsaw out there in the, in the local towns helping them clear this land so they could um, expand the dairies at that time. In fact, they were expanding in areas that had been historically limited to beef and sheep production. This is a, a beef and sheep farm, and some of that terrain is extremely steep. Uh, this picture does not really do that justice, but just imagine some of these mountains over here behind us and having grass pretty much all the way to the top of that and trying to run dairy cattle on that. Now, it's one thing to run sheep on that, it's another thing to run dairy cattle on that. So as a consequence, they really started running into problems with nutrient management. And they quickly realized they have a problem because the other major industry in New Zealand, the number one industry in New Zealand is tourism. This kind of scenic view like you see here is very common in New Zealand and it attracts a lot of visitors over the, over the uh, course of the year. And their number one industry there and the number one supporter of their GDP is uh, the uh, tourism industry. So they're using a lot of technological advances here to, uh, to try to minimize the impact and, and one of the real challenges that they've, they've run into is because of this uh, urban and or this uh, this rural interface with a lot of these tourism areas, sometimes they're in conflict. This uh, this is an example of, a, of an area where there's a lot of sheep and beef production, and this happens just be the picture of the sheep herd. On the back side of that is a little place called Hobbiton. You ever heard of the the movies, The Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies and that sort of thing? Well, all of that was filmed or a big chunk of those movies were filmed in this little area called Hobbiton, which is the set that they built to, uh, to be in those movies. That Hobbiton area attracts about 500 to 600,000 visitors a year. Um, I first went there right after they, they opened. I happened to be over there, and, and the guy was a beef and sheep producer, unlike, not unlike uh, many of you all, 
and he was just literally overwhelmed with the number of people that were coming out of the woodwork. The first time that I was there, and it was a little shed basically that they had uh, to take tickets or sell tickets and to sell some, uh, uh, you know, some gift shop items and whatnot. The next time I was there, it was about twice the size of this building. Uh, <laughs> Of, of how much they actually had to, uh, to, to interact with those uh, visitors. But the point is, is that this is right up against the areas where they're getting a lot of expansion, and, and they need to preserve the scenery there as much as possible. This is uh, another example of that. This is uh, uh, Gundy and Lisa Anderson, who uh, operate Bog Roy Station, which is on the South Island. And this is the view. It's really hard to see in this picture, but trust me, it is gorgeous. But this is the view out there, uh, out their front door, basically. And it's very rolling terrain, uh, lots of uh, 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 stones and, and beautiful countryside, but also lots of challenges with nitrate leaching through the soil. And because they have all these pristine lakes back here, those lakes are, are just the richest cobalt blue that you've ever seen. It is just, it is as if, as if you had just seen it in its natural condition before anything ever happened. There's no houses around those lakes. I mean, it's, it's just amazing how beautiful it is. But they're wanting to try to keep it that way, and the way that they're doing that is they're putting caps on the amount of nitrate that can be leached off of these farms. So you, you as a farmer, for example, would have a limit as to how much nitrate could be leached out of your soil getting into the groundwater that's feeding these lakes. That, that number was generated by a computer model called or Overseer. It's kind of an Orwellian name, I think. It's straight out of 1984, Overseer. It actually was originally developed by uh, the fertilizer industry so that they could minimize the, the loss of nitrogen in their fertilizer applications. They were trying to be good stewards and uh, ultimately, the, the regulatory agencies took that model and then converted it over to using it as a regulatory uh, uh, tool. But what they've done to try to deal with this is to get a system by which they can expand their land base a little bit with irrigation. It's hard to see in this photo, but there's a lot of stony land here. It's very difficult to grow anything on it in, in the absence of moisture. But if they have water, and some clover seed, like in this case, uh, they can run a lot more head of sheep. And it's hard to see in that picture, but there's thousands, excuse me, thousands of sheep on, uh, on Gundy and Lisa's uh, farm there. One of the quotes that came out of this, and, and the reason that they have been so successful, I believe, is that they've been very actively engaged in this whole process. And one of the quotes that came over from many of the New Zealanders we talked about, talked with there, and particularly them, they said, if we aren't at the table, we're on the menu. Now think about that for a minute and the way that we, in our industry, interacts with some of the regulatory aspects of, of our industry. We oftentimes aren't at that table as much. Now, the farm bureaus of the world and some of the other uh, uh, support industries do a great job of helping to try to put a voice to that. But uh, these folks actually, Gundy and Lisa will actually go to those meetings. In many cases, they're on some of the boards that serve to help establish some of those regulatory policies. So um, they are very, very actively engaged in that. Here's another example of this. This is in uh, the North Island. This is uh, Lake Taupo, which is a major lake there in the North Island. This is some uh, grass-finished beef that uh, this gentleman, Mike Barton, and his wife, uh, Sharon. Mike and Sharon Barton operate Taupo Beef, and they supply this resort town with uh, high-end grass-fed beef. And uh, what's really interesting here is that Mike and Sharon were also subjected to that same nitrogen cap of how much they could uh, stock their pastures. And so they recognized that the computer model really was overestimating the amount of nitrates that were leaching out of their soil. So they decided to so get some financial support from some granting agencies, and they hired Dr. Malcolm McLeod, who's a soil scientist, to do some research on their own farm using their own soil. They made these uh, columns of soil, like, like you see here. They just drove those um, uh, steel uh, columns into the ground to extract that, that column of soil. 
and they placed it on top of these uh, concrete uh, cisterns. And basically what they did is they filled all that back in. And so here's, here's one of those columns of soil back at the soil surface level now with the different type of species on it. And with rainfall, then, then they're measuring how much leachate is coming out the bottom. So they actually have real soil from their own farm and their own conditions here and uh, taking little sips of that water with some machinery that's hidden underground here in this cistern and being able to measure how much nitrate is coming out. And it turns out it's about a third uh, of what the computer model said that was coming out of the ground. So they've been able to uh, work with the industry, work with the environmental regulators because they were also at the table. They were also part of the board that was making these decisions and they were able to engage with them to make sure that they were able to uh, adjust the, the numbers in that model to accurately reflect what was going on on their farm. Other researchers are looking at this issue as well. Dr. Rachel Bryant and a lot of her colleagues there at Lincoln University uh, have been working on this issue. Uh, here she is standing in some perennial ryegrass and red clover uh, uh, mixture here. Anybody recognize this on the left hand side? A little hard to tell from that photo. Plantain, exactly. Uh, a, a cousin to buckhorn plantain. Now this is not the little tiny buckhorn plantain that you're used to. This is, those leaves are about that wide and they're about this tall. So the very productive uh, forage variety of these uh, plantains. Uh, and they also have a very deep taproot. So they're going down looking for nitrogen down deep in the soil and uh, sucking that nitrates out before it has a chance to get into the groundwater. They're also conducting these little uh, soil column tests where they're measuring leachate and making sure that they're ahead of that, uh, that curve there. They're even going to the point of putting uh, uh, collection devices uh, to catch the urine and feces off of these, these dairy cattle that are grazing out there. And so those are the, probably one of the most instrumented uh, dairy cattle that you would ever run into. They've got a lot of different instruments on them. Another uh, in instance of this is uh, Craig McKenzie, and Craig and his wife Roz McKenzie run Greenvale Pastures. Um, Craig is a, a very interesting guy. He has a dairy and he has a uh, row crop operation. He's been very uh, active in the precision ag movement, and in particular the precision irrigation movement there in the South Island of New Zealand where uh, water is very much a limiting resource. And his water use efficiency is, a, is uh, about three times higher than most of his uh, contemporaries around there. But Craig was recently uh, recognized as the International Precision Ag uh, Farmer of the Year. I, th I believe that was last year when he received that award, um, shortly after we had visited him uh, the previous year. So this is an example of how producers, I think, really can get engaged and, and uh, make, a, make a big impact, not only their local uh, part of the world, but also around the world. Just to kind of summarize some of those lessons I think that we can take back from that, back down to the southeast, what are those lessons? First of all, these cooperative farming systems can thrive when setting supply and negotiating prices. I, I think one of the real challenges that we have here in the U.S. is that we don't have that as many of those cooperatives operating, uh, especially on the supply side. We certainly have that on the, on the price, uh, or excuse me, on the, uh, on the input side with groups like Southern States and the co-ops of, of that supply many of our producers, but we don't necessarily have that uh, quota system like they do in, in, in with Fonterra. So to be able to market milk through Fonterra, you have to be a shareholder in Fonterra. And there is a set amount of milk that is for each of those shares. So it effectively develops a quota system and limits supply. And therefore, it helps them to uh, regulate and negotiate prices. So they don't have the wide swings in milk prices, or at least not as wide in those milk prices as what we do here in the U.S. Now, the other thing is, is because of all of this uh, outsourcing of a lot of the custom hire work and that, that they have such a thriving rural economy, uh, it, it trickles down through the rest of the rural economy. And as a result, every small town pretty much is, is thriving as a result. And I, I don't want to say that, uh, I don't want you to get the impression that I'm saying we, we should just get rid of all government assistance at all. Uh, you know, that is absolutely not what I'm saying. I still like to have a job. 
Uh, and I still would like for us to have a very active NRCS program and doing some of the great things that they're doing. What my point is, is that they can, they have been able to industry fund a lot of the research and development things that they need to have done, a lot of the promotion aspects that they need to have done, and a lot of the other assistance that they offer their producers through industry funded initiatives. So the industry, in my opinion, may be able to more efficiently assist individual farms to be able to solve a lot of those on-farm issues that they're dealing with. And more importantly, if they are facing an industry-wide issue, an environmental regulation or uh, labor issues or something like that, having positive engagement in that process, not being one that's just saying, uh, no, y'all can't do that, that's going to hurt us. We have to engage in that process. We have to say, this is the problem. Here are some proposed solutions. We need to be bringing solutions to that table, not just uh, complaints. And I would just really like to reiterate this thought that if we aren't at that table, we may very well be on the menu. So being actively engaged as often as you can, not, even, not necessarily on the national scale, but e even in the local uh, environment, the local regulatory aspects, your local planning and zoning meetings, go to those, be involved, you know, and, and take part in that as much as you can. Not just to be a, uh, an obstacle, but to be part of the solution. So just, uh, I'll leave you with that, just some comments, uh, uh, and, some, and if you've got some questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. If you're interested on some of uh, our travels, I've written about this quite a few times, uh, and it's available on our website as well as a lot of other information about forage management on georgiaforages.com. And with that, if you've got any questions, comments, emotional outbursts, we'll take those too.